In this video, I will largely refer to Emily is Away 3 as just Emily is Away, for convenience sake. This video will also discuss Emily is Away's plot in detail, so if you're interested in playing, I suggest you do that first and then come back to the video. Emily is Away 3 is, surprise surprise, the sequel to Emily is Away and Emily is Away 2. However, whereas the first two games sought to replicate AOL Instant Messenger, 3 broadens its scope and instead is presented through Facebook circa 2008 to 2009. What type of game is Emily is Away, though? Well, in simple terms, it's a dating sim, but that doesn't really do it justice, I feel. It's a dating sim through the lens of a mock Facebook, Face Nook, that lovingly captures the internet culture of the late 2000s and portrays a budding high school romance. If you've used Facebook at any point in your life, it won't take you long to get familiar with the gameplay. The main gameplay loop, like any other dating sim, mainly consists of talking with other characters, picking one of three dialogue choices from a chat window. Emily is Away is elevated, though, through its clever framing. If this type of game isn't your thing, that's totally understandable. If it wasn't for its unique presentation, I probably wouldn't have played through it. The game, I feel, tries its hardest to maintain your attention and engagement. Getting ahead of myself a little here, but the entire game being presented and framed this way is, I think, brilliant. This isn't really something any other form of media can convey. Of course, there are many films that take place solely on a computer screen, most even featuring some form of social media as a motif, but by their nature they cannot involve their audience the same way Emily is Away does. What I'm about to say may sound hyperbolic, but this game, on paper, may be the most immersive game I've ever played. Let me explain. Again, if you've ever used Facebook, you should already be familiar with how Emily is Away works. You've most likely had conversations on Facebook, more than likely scrolled through your newsfeed, probably looked through someone's profile, Point is, you've used Facebook. Emily is Away is maybe the only video game that I've played that is a one-to-one -one recreation of something I've actually experienced in reality, even considering something like iRacing or Farming Simulator, which can be played with a steering wheel and pedals. Granted, using Facebook is a much less involved process than driving a race car, but the minimalism also lends itself to a heightened sense of immersion. Before I get too carried away, let's get into the story. The story starts off in the modern day. You're absentmindedly scrolling through your feed when you get a memory notification, reminding the player character of when they first joined Facenook. You click on the memory and are brought back to the summer of 2008. It's the last stretch of summer vacation before you begin your senior year of high school. Your buddy Matt helps you set up your profile and familiarizes you with Facenook's layout. At the midpoint of chapter one, you're introduced to Emily and Evelyn. They're friends with the player character and are both throwing end of summer parties. Evelyn is setting up a full-on house party while Emily is preparing a quieter barbecue and bonfire affair. Matt leaves the choice to you as to which party to attend. The story somewhat splits from here, but each path will play out largely the same from here until the end of the game. At the start of Chapter 2, you'll have grown closer to whichever girl through the party you chose to attend in Chapter 1. You'll also have grown apart from the other girl, however. It's about a month into the school year now. You shoot the breeze with Matt and he says he's been noticing how close you've gotten with, let's just say, Evelyn. Evelyn messages you, you chat with her for a bit, do a quiz she forwards you, and then, most likely, you start to open up to each other. The dialogue, for lack of a better term, in this section is scarily authentic. It feels very true to life for the whole game, but this part, portraying two teenagers awkwardly expressing their feelings for one another, hit a really powerful note with me. If you were a teenager from basically any point in the last, say, 15 years, there's a good chance you've had a conversation almost identical to some presented in the game. I'm getting off topic somewhat, but the way the characters interact with one another feels incredibly realistic, at least to me. Sure, adults don't act like this typically, but melodramatic teenagers absolutely do. Anyways, by the end of Chapter 2, you and Evelyn have likely made things official. Chapter 3 begins just past Christmas. You and Evelyn have been going strong for about two months, but Matt just got dumped by his girlfriend, Kelly, and isn't taking it well. Kelly messages you and asks you to basically console Matt. The majority of Chapter 3 is spent trying to make Matt feel better, if you're a good person anyway. You have a date planned tonight with Evelyn, but Matt could really use a friend. You can either choose to honor your plans with Evelyn or spend time with Matt. No matter which you choose, there's trouble on the horizon. Chapter 4 fills me with dread. That's not an indictment on its quality. Quite the contrary, actually. Chapter 4 serves to plant seeds of doubt in your mind about your partner's fidelity. It's spring, graduation is coming up quickly, and you're under the belief that you and Evelyn are fine. Matt messages you with some distressing information, though. He says that Evelyn has been flirting with another guy in Facenook, Steve, from one of her classes. You investigate and are allowed to come to your own conclusions. Getting slightly off topic again, Emily is away probably has the most respect I've seen for player choice in any game, on a medium scale anyway. The options to choose from in any situation are typically made very clear, meaning that there was never a disconnect between what I thought my player character would say and what he ended up saying. Some games can be very vague about that. Adding to this, there's very few times you're locked in with something you said or a choice you made. You're usually given a chance to reconsider your stance. For example, in this chapter, when you're investigating Evelyn's friend, the game gives you the chance to very organically switch between being suspicious, furious, or trusting, or just generally unsure. Emily is away very rarely does the typical video game thing of locking you in one path and making you fully commit to it. This has the advantage of making everything, again, feel very lifelike. 
Unless you're blind with rage or grief, it's unlikely that you behave how most characters do in standard choice-driven games. As a result, again again, all of these characters, their responses, and your responses feel very genuine. There are degrees to everything. Nothing's ever black and white. There are a multitude of ways to end Chapter 4. You can aggressively confront Evelyn and accuse her of cheating, ignore it entirely, make her stop talking to Steve, or even just break up with her. Besides the initial decision of which party to attend in Chapter 1, this is the biggest splitting point in the plot, and the closest thing resembling a climax. Just for convenience sake, we'll head into the final chapter assuming you made Evelyn stop talking to Steve, though her behavior in Chapter 5 is already somewhat predetermined regardless of what you do. I'll come back to this. In Chapter 5, Evelyn is clearly distant from the player character. The divide is extremely well portrayed. After you make plans with Matt and his new not-girlfriend, Evelyn messages the player, coming across pretty apathetic. You talk with her, and she basically tells you she wants a break. Not to break up, just a break. This set off alarm bells in my head immediately, because I faced literally the exact same situation with my high school girlfriend. I was in high school too, you sicko. What this basically translates to is, I want to break up with you, but also have you on standby in case I start to want you back. After a lengthy conversation, in some way, yours and Evelyn's relationship ends. She posts about it because, well, she's a melodramatic teenager in the early days of social media, and Matt swoops in to ask what happened. He offers to hang out, to which you can accept or decline, and the game ends. I definitely glossed over most of the subplots, and I really can't recount everything or else we'd be here all day, but that's the main story, and it's all you need to know right now. If I was to try and read any meaning into the story, I would say it's probably about learning how to overcome obstacles as a couple properly. That is to say, approach the problem as a team rather than as a me-against-you type of thing. Admittedly, that might be reaching, but I'm not sure the game's creator, Kyle Seeley, did make it with the intent of saying anything. Maybe it's just meant to be a nostalgic, deftly written, and occasionally heartbreaking slice-of-life tale of young love gone awry. In which case, for me at least, it absolutely succeeded. Overall, I loved it, though I don't think it's without fault. Having just covered the story in macro, I want to dive deeper and explore why the game works as opposed to how. I mentioned before that the game does its best to hold your attention. Dating sims are typically very dry, at least to me, and I find that unless you're 100% invested in the writing, most people will become bored very quickly. Emily is a way differentiates itself by featuring a lot of stuff to do outside of the main chats. The best part to me is that it blends story and gameplay together effortlessly. You can open links in the game and be brought to a real web page. Feel free to read up on the latest gaming news of 2008 on EGN.com. Read through anonymous confessions and judge people who aren't even real. Browse through the most popular MP3s of the time and more. Note, however, that you'll have to really scour through your friends' pages for these links. It's nothing super involved, but it can be fun to stumble onto every once in a while. Something a little more involved and extraordinarily clever is YouTube or YouTube. Characters will frequently post links to curated YouTube playlists. Again, another excellent way to characterize them, since their personalities and general mind states really shine through with the type of music they post. It's also genius from a game design perspective. You don't need to license any music when you can just include a link to a music video on YouTube. This all feels consistent with and natural to the game world. The music almost feels hard-coded into the game sometimes with how well it fits certain scenes. I would imagine this is intentional, at least somewhat, but since the music isn't technically a part of the game, I'm still blown away by how well-timed it seems to be. That's the power of suggestion, I guess. It's used to great effect in some areas. In my Emily playthrough, as her and my player character are opening up to each other and doing the whole I really like you thing, Sex on Fire by Kings of Leon was playing in the background, and good god if I wasn't absolutely smitten in the moment. Of course, after the chapter break, I thought, wow, I'm pathetic, but it's just such a sweet, tender moment portrayed equal parts whimsic and grounded. The dialogue was, of course, on point. I flashed back to saying these same types of things to my high school girlfriend and her reacting in a very similar way to Emily. It's incredible, and I'll stop droning on about it, but I genuinely think it's one of my favorite moments I've ever experienced in a video game. I mentioned at the top of the video that Emily is Away 3 is much more expansive than its predecessors. Again, the first two games replicate AOL Instant Messenger, which I have no first-hand experience with. Regardless, I know there's a reason AIM died. Facebook was a much more involving platform. This is used to full effect in 3. You can look through anyone's profile, provided you're friends with them, and glean a ton of information about their personal lives, their hopes, their interests, random factoids, etc. One of my favorite things that sets 3 far above 1 and 2 is a visual collection of characters and events, which is just a convoluted way of saying that 3 features photos of its happenings, whereas 1 and 2 didn't. It does a great deal to further contextualize the world. Everything is represented through very simple, but very striking, minimalist pixel art. It's detailed enough so that you can easily tell what each photo is trying to convey, but also basic to the point which your mind will fill in the blanks. It's very distinctive, and I think it's the best way these characters could be portrayed visually. Some of the art is downright beautiful, and even removed from context, it's quite appealing. I'm not sure if color theory plays into it, but each character is given a different color to represent them. The only time I know a character's color is used to denote their role in the story is with Jeff slash Steve, being depicted as a literal red flag. 
This simple characterization is most certainly the exception rather than the rule, however. Each and every character is given enough time to breathe and express themselves thoroughly. These aren't the most complex characters I've ever seen in a game, but they are depicted very well. By the end of the game, it's likely that you'll become attached to at least one of the characters, most likely Emily or Evelyn. Emily and Evelyn are clearly very different people, though with an alternate route on your second playthrough, the line can become blurred. I want to say quickly before moving on that I do think the game is worthy of a second playthrough. Your choices are actually quite dynamic in how they'll affect the story, and there are more than a few branching paths that can be fun to explore. All that being said, I want to discuss some disappointments I have with the game structure. They're far from damning, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention them. Quickly though, let's talk about Emily and Evelyn in a general sense. Emily is, well, I don't want to say introvert because that's never expressed. Basically, Emily isn't quite a social butterfly like Evelyn is shown to be. She's far from unpopular, but she's never said to be as outgoing as Evelyn is. She reads books, plays Mario Kart, and, in general, lives more conservatively than Evelyn. Evelyn, on the other hand, has a more troubled home life and some ex-boyfriend woes. She loves to drink and party. Emily is more into indie and electronic music, where Evelyn is punk rock and hip-hop. Evelyn wants to go to school for art, Emily hopes to become an engineer. There's more, but you get the idea. They're their own people. It's weird, then, that they share a lot of the exact same life experiences. Both will tell you their most angst-ridden memories of climbing onto their roofs at night as kids, listening to music while stargazing. The only difference being that Emily listened to Nickelback while Evelyn was rocking some Fallout Boy. They both refer to their iPods as their babies. They both have the same reaction to being asked out. They both attend a concert with you in between chapters 3 and 4. Senses fail for Evelyn, Snow Patrol for Emily, and they both even have a problem with goodbyes. No doubt on a first playthrough this won't bother anyone, because they'll have no knowledge of it, but on my subsequent playthroughs it was disappointing. It's unfortunate, because once the curtain's pulled back, it robs each of them of a lot of their individuality. Sometimes, lines that feel natural for Emily to say come across as totally out of character for Evelyn, and vice versa. It's not a deal-breaker, and like I said, I think both paths are different enough to warrant a second playthrough, it's just unfortunate that so much of one path is the same as the other. Again, there are plenty of differences. They're both clearly different characters in a general sense. They'll both dress up as something different for Halloween, they both want different things in life, and they clearly have different interests. But they're also sometimes literal reskins of one another. I was initially hesitant to make this complaint because, as far as I know, the game is made by just one guy, and he clearly poured his heart and soul into it already. I don't know how game development really works, but I I imagine it would be a ton of work to make each path completely different from one another. Again, it's far from a deal breaker, but on a second playthrough it is disappointing. Like I mentioned before, however, there are multiple branching paths to take which can dramatically alter the course of the story. Not everything you do matters, but what does matter, really matters. In one of my playthroughs with Evelyn, I made the choice at the end of Chapter 3 to cancel our date and spend time with Matt instead, with Evelyn's blessing. In Chapter 4, I made Evelyn stop talking to Steve. In Chapter 5, Evelyn called me out on my blatant hypocrisy and broke up with me. Another time, I broke up with Evelyn in Chapter 4. Side note, you have to be irrationally aggressive in order to be able to do this. Anyway, I broke up with her and in Chapter 5 she reached out to try and get closure, and perhaps to see if we could still be friends. I told her to hit the bricks. But I could have relented and apologized, or I could have simply shut her out. It turns out Matt encouraged her to reach out and he wasn't exactly thrilled when I told her to leave me alone. This leads to the worst ending, where nobody wants you. If I had accepted Evelyn's peace offering, then Matt would stick by me. Or, alternatively, I could have ignored the red flags in Chapter 4 and been broken up with anyway. Yeah, earlier when I mentioned that Evelyn and Emily's behavior is predetermined in Chapter 5, this is what I meant. On your first playthrough, you always fail. I applaud the game for allowing you to fail in multiple ways, but you'll always end up single when the credits hit. Your second playthrough, however, doesn't have to be like this. Whichever girl you fail with initially, you can succeed with the other one on your second go. For example, say your first playthrough is with Emily. After you complete that timeline, you can start another and pursue Evelyn and, given that you ignore some baser instincts, I'll come back to this, you'll end up together with her in the end. The game being set up this way recontextualizes what its main message might be. See, with the knowledge that you can succeed and maintain your relationship in one playthrough, I see the game being about overcoming relationship problems in a healthy way. Again, attack any problem together. With your first playthrough always being doomed to fail, though, it becomes about not always getting what you want. You can try, and you can do everything quote-unquote right, but you're never guaranteed success. It seems even more likely that this is the case considering Matt and Kelly's relationship. When Kelly breaks up with Matt, she tells you that they just grew apart. She doesn't hate him, they just want different things out of life. Matt didn't do anything wrong, it's just life. It's also noteworthy that after Kelly breaks up with Matt, she seemingly starts to date whichever girl you didn't pursue. Just like how Evelyn slash Emily appears to pursue Steve slash Jeff in their respective bad endings. And if you break up with them in Chapter 4, by Chapter 5 they're already dating them. This is brutal. I have a few problems with the way it's set up. First off, I think it's almost impossible to not be naturally suspicious in Chapter 4. Jeff slash Steve is clearly coming on pretty hard to Emily slash Evelyn, to the point where I felt foolish having to ignore it to get a good ending. 
I was trying to get the good ending with Emily, and in order to do that, you basically can't call her out on anything with Jeff. I think Chapter 4 would have worked better if it was more ambiguous as to whether or not Emily was flirting with Jeff. Her saying that her prom color should be red, the communication with Jeff through their wall posts, him being really forward. All of this says, hey, there's something going on here. Obviously that's intentional, but I think the whole sequence would have been massively improved by an increased level of vagueness. That way, there would be reasonable doubt. But you'd also second-guess yourself and go, hmm, well, maybe, but no. But wait a minute, and you'd be left to make a judgment call. You still are left to make a judgment call, but with how heavy-handed their flirting can come across, you'll likely not be swayed by anything Emily tells you, since it blatantly contradicts what you've been reading in your feed. Or maybe I'm just paranoid. I narrow the game's meaning down to one of two things. Either you can do everything right and still not win, which you'll probably feel after your first playthrough, or, paradoxically, you can maintain your relationship by doing everything right and overcoming obstacles hand in hand with your partner. The way the game is structured, with the good ending only unlocking after you achieve the bad ending, doesn't alleviate my confusion. This isn't nearly as damning as I'm probably about to make it sound. I just find it peculiar that the game presents two directly opposing ideas. If it's supposed to be about life not being fair or just, why include the ending where you stay with Emily slash Evelyn? If it's supposed to be about learning how to properly overcome hurdles in a relationship, why restrict that same ending? If you haven't done anything wrong and your relationship ending is just due to you and Emily growing apart, why is she trying to gaslight you into taking a break? You know, I make all these points and in the end, they almost don't matter. I try to apply reason, rationality, and logic to these characters only to come up just short. I'm starting to think that might have been the point. These have been some of the most decidedly realistic characters I've ever interacted with in a game. How many people in your life have lied to you? Said they'd do something only to turn around and do the opposite. I could easily see why you'd find this explanation unsatisfactory in relation to Emily is away, but maybe it's what the game intends. People are irrational, most times without even realizing. Maybe I'm wrong for trying to read so much into it. Don't get me wrong, if this was a more conventional game, I wouldn't be nearly as forgiving regarding character inconsistencies. That being said, Emily is Away never fails to depict its characters in an extremely believable way. In another game, I'd be bothered if a character directly contradicted themselves in front of me, because I'd see that as a sign of poor writing. In Emily is Away, it's upsetting because it's such a believable and human betrayal. It hits the perfect sweet spot where the characters contradict themselves ever so slightly and infrequently enough that it's hard to notice initially, but it's also not overdone to the point where they just feel schizophrenic. Basically, it's convincing. Even though I don't think it's trying to be, I find Emily is a way to be profound. It's profound in how committed it is to being pedestrian. It perfectly captures a time, place, and numerous other things without being overly sensational. It's equal parts warm, genuine, whimsical, nostalgic, and bittersweet. I adore this game and highly recommend you play it, even if you don't think it'll be your thing. Even if you're able to walk away from Emily as a way without much to think on, there's almost no chance you'll walk away without at least a little bit of a sting in your heart.